Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Plot Lines. I'm your host, Connor. And today we're, we're discussing a sort of a movie that might be a bit, a bit surprising to many of the audience. You know, it's not really necessarily what you might expect from Plot Lines, the sort of type of movie. Mm-hmm. But we're going to be discussing, as the title says, uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And I, I, I was telling Jeff before we got on or before we started recording that I really just kind of came across this, like I've seen it multiple times, but I, uh, recently I uh, was watching it and it just, uh, you know, parts of it just made me go like, oh, this is this is great. Like I we need to talk about this. And I, I uh, Jeff, you know, sort of asked me like, OK, what are we going to what are we going to talk about for for next for our next episode? And I was like, let's do Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And Jeff, do you want to uh, say anything about what you how you responded to me? Uh, yeah, I was, first of all, just surprised because, you know, it's it's a step away. Usually we're doing something that has a direct, you know, moral purpose and or ties into Catholicism, virtue. So to do something that's so purely just ingrained in pop culture, uh, I was, you know, surprised when you suggested it. But when you s- said why you wanted to talk about it, I was like, okay, that's a lens I've never viewed this from, so I'm more than happy to take another look. So let's get into it. <laughs> yes, exactly. So uh, my my the way I'm looking at this mainly is that um, that more or less comedy is a critique. Now uh, it's a critique of uh, something going on in society, and I think this movie does an actually great job of critiquing society now the problem with a lot of comedy these days is it proceeds to give you an answer that is wrong like it sort of tries Mm -hmm. to give you a sort of a way out of the problem of society but it actually usually digs you deeper into the hole that you're already in and that the movie does that too but the critique is just so you know damning it's so uh great that that's why i had to talk to jeff about this um you know so obviously you know pretty much everyone knows the story i mean it's it's right there ferris bueller's day off ferris bueller is a high school kid he is um and this is the 80s he you know pretends to be sick and uh goes off with his friends and gets them out as well well one's already sick um which we're going to talk about cameron cameron's a really interesting character yeah and uh so is the girlfriend too um pretty much every character has an interesting element to them uh that we're probably going to be able to discuss but the point is is that he you know the premise of it is he goes out and he has to get back by six Mm o'clock in order to not get caught by his parents and you know spoiler alert he succeeds that's not really the point of this discussion mm-hmm. uh, so we're not going to really go through sort of a plot to s- plot discussion like yeah. we usually do because th- there's no real point in talking about the plot but i think we need to talk about sort of what the backdrop is so first of all it takes place in the northwest suburbs of chicago for anybody who doesn't know this is one of the wealthiest places in like in Chicago and you know Chicago is basically you know the rich and the poor more or less right together and this is you know not the not the city but it's you know Cook County and it's extremely extremely wealthy and it and it just shows the corruption even in the 80s at how why society is going downhill I mean, these kids have no ambitions of any kind in any good nature. Uh, they're more or less in prison in in these high schools. And the high schools are so wealthy that they almost look like college uh, buildings. Mm-hmm. Like the, the if you look at it, like uh, if you go into a college uh, lecture hall, you know, it kind of raises up, you know, like usually like, you know, it's going back um, like that. And a lot of these places, and they shot in an actual high school, so that those are real, um, real depictions of schools. Uh, and it's it's just incredibly how, incredible how wealthy it is. But the point is, is people are you know throughout the whole movie, you're we're seeing cuts 
of of basically like uh, students dying of boredom in prison. Um, so first, Jeff, do you have anything you want to add about sort of the uh, the sort of scene, like the or the um, scenery, the you know backdrop, I guess. Yeah. Um, the one thing I'd add in with that is it's kind of an interesting contrast for what we've seen uh, just for the last few discussions we've had with Dead Poet Society and with the Emperor's Club, where you had engaged students really, you know, I, they were private um, boarding schools that students were going to. And now you have really bored students and really bored teachers that are in this, you know, little suburban public school. And especially Rooney, the principal, is, I, I think all of the characters are in one way or another a caricature, but they mm -hmm. pull it off so well. But he is just so power hungry over this tiny little kingdom that he has that he can't deal with any subversion. And I just think that's a very, again, just big contrast from the types of schools that we've previously been discussing on this channel. Uh, well said. Also, one thing about Rooney, the re I think the reason Rooney's character is so power hungry is because he doesn't have any education element to actually worry about. His job is not to uh, educate the students. I think it's kind of funny when he sort of mentions himself or calls himself an educator, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but really that's code for herding the sheep around, mm -hmm. like making sure they stay in line. Again, this like they're making these parallels to prisons and stuff like that, you know, very clearly. And I don't think they're wrong. That critique of of public schools, which don't don't forget, this is a rich public school. We're not talking about like, um, you know, inner city public schools that are basically war zones. We're talking about the sort of the Frankfurt school boredom, like. Uh, making everyone basically clones of each other, uh, destroying the imagination of students, basically destroying their will to do to do anything except for whatever the state needs them to do. Yeah, and I think that that's perfectly displayed by the ways in which we see the two main male characters while they are at home for the first uh, part of the school day. Because we have Ferris Bueller, who obviously has faked being sick. And before he gets picked up by Cameron, he has nothing to do. So you see him just making awful sounds on a clarinet and like taking a shower and doing crazy things with his hair. He has nothing to do. Like there's nothing productive. He's just not wanting to do deal with school and then Cameron on the other hand is just so stuck in ennui and can't you know even get the motivation to get out of bed that he's just stuck there well yeah he's been he's more or less poisoned like he mm -hmm. he's more or less like uh he's kind of like a Thaden character uh Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to look at sort of a Lord of the Rings reference he's you know there's nothing like actually seemingly physically wrong with him uh, he's not actually sick, uh, at, but at least in the, of the body, he's like sick of the brain of the soul, that type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. and in some sense, they're trying to break him out of that, you know, like that's kind of Ferris's somewhat mission though. You know, he's more selfish in his, in his designs, but you know, his sort of secondary goal is to break Cameron out of his, uh, um, his, his, uh, messed up situation or his you know his uh, lack of will to do anything but mm. i mean he just kind of drives him to accept the fact that his life is miserable and with no way to actually um you know more or less just to rebel instead you know just to accept accept his situation and um not accept it in a sense of like suffering accepting that but in a way where it's more or less going to drive him further away from anything that's good. 
Yeah, absolutely. Now, one last thing about Rooney. Also, I don't know if I said this, but that he he doesn't. The reason he can't be an educator, because maybe, you know, like let's theorize like 20 years ago, maybe he wanted to maybe he was sort of idealistic. Maybe he wanted to be an educator. Let's just give him the benefit of the doubt. But the these parents, the parents of the students are so like are so entitled and so wealthy that they've basically uh, taken all power out of the hands of like the uh, teachers and administrators. Not that they, not that power necessarily should be in the, their hands either, but when they're they're they have that power, they're not teaching their kids. I mean, the whole reason this movie takes place entirely is because both parents work. Yep. And it's the case for both uh, Cameron and Ferris. Yes. And I, we assume also uh, the girlfriend. Sloan. Yeah. Sloan. Yes. Sloan. We, we assume that Sloan probably parents do the same thing, but it's possible. It's possible I, that's not true. I think that it's a fair assumption given there's a scene in which like they call and are routing through different phone numbers and there's like <laughs> a message that's left by Sloan's family uh, for where to actually find them. So it's, I think fair to assume that the mom is not in the house. The dad obviously isn't there. So they were able to go back to her house, record a new message for the voicemail and say like you know call this other place and um so it i think it's fair to say or it's fair to assume that all three of the main characters don't have parents that are staying at home yeah so th the parents aren't committed to any sense of education they're more or less just treating school like daycare so there's no power and and it's similar to sort of the um the Emperor's Club thing with um, the sort of main antagonist for the teacher, you know, he's more or less there for daycare uh, sort of to learn stuff more so to learn a little bit more than like these people. Uh, but like the parents aren't really concerned about the education of their kids, you know, um, yeah. as like one of the things that's so interesting to me is like the famous Bueller, Bueller scene. <laughs> they're actually going over fascinating material, in my opinion. Like they're talking about what led to the Great Depression and the uh, actual, you know, stupid uh, pieces of legislation that made it even worse. And uh, at the same time, in the opening monologue where Ferris Bueller's talking about, like, you know, I'm supposed to be learning about European socialism. I, I'm not in Europe. I'm not a socialist. Yeah, I'm Who not cares? Europe. I have no plans of being a European. Uh, why should I care whether or not there is socialists? Yeah. They could be fascist anarchists. I wouldn't care. I exactly. love exactly. I love that because it's a contradiction of uh, of terminology for the most part. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you know, fascist it, anarchists are in, in some sense a contradiction, but you yeah, know, I guess absolutely. And I just find it fascinating that they first start off with him, like just saying that he doesn't believe in anything, he doesn't believe in isms. And yeah, wait, let me let me do this quote, uh, yes, please. People should not believe in, in isms, but believe in himself. You know, like that's all he has. That's I mean, that's all he's been taught to believe in because that's all his parents believe in. They yeah. believe in themselves. They believe in their career. They're selfish beings. You know, like even the mom, she I mean, the closest th thing she has to a non-selfish uh, thought is, you know, she calls Mr. Rooney or Mr. Rooney calls her and says, mm -hmm. you know, like your your son's absent, you know, blah, blah, blah. Do you, are you aware of that? And he, she's like, yes. You know, I, you know, it was so bad. I even thought about staying and like staying with him. Mm -hmm. Like th yeah. that's the closest thing you get to like an actual like level yeah. of interest or caring. Like, you know, there's always, there are these, um, these like little, like, um, little moments when they're like, you know, sort of treating him like a baby, you know, like, 
babying him, but they're not, it's not, it's, it's more like an act. If they cared, you know, the mom would have stayed home and she, you know, she, the, the, both of the parents have extremely good jobs. Yep. Like, I mean, the, the dad's obviously working in some like, you know, um, rich company in, uh, in the middle of the city, you know, he's in one of the, uh, the skyscrapers, you know, working, you know, in an office and, uh, you know, he's going to fancy lunches and stuff like that, you know, like he taking out customers to fancy yeah, and lunches. It's, and it's the eighties. This isn't like, um, you know, uh, this isn't the, this isn't now, this isn't like a inflated economy it's, or yeah. Yeah, no, it's not an inflated economy. Yeah. It's it's a booming economy. There's no reason for the mom to be in uh in um what is it? She in um real estate. I real believe. estate. And to be fair, she could theoretically figure out a way to be in real estate and not let it affect her uh her ability to parent. Yeah, absolutely. Like, that was one of the main things that I thought about with especially those opening scenes was both just how little actual care and then also going back to again we discussed last time like the difference between the baby boomers gen x and millennials like you know i am a millennial and if i was sick my mom wasn't going anywhere but and you know it's just not even really a thought that you know they think he's really sick they hear other things from like uh, you know we're really pulling for him from the police station yeah the, the police care more than like yeah and she's like oh yeah thanks yeah but there's just there isn't that you know just maternal desire that should be there to care for your child who isn't feeling well and he even like that's another like interesting piece is that he even talks about like you don't want to go with the actual, like, you know, give yourself a fever with a hot water bottle or anything because you might end up at the doctor. It's like he's scammed them so much and so well that he knows how to be sick, but not too sick. Yeah, he knows how to avoid uh, getting them concerned with him, you know, yep. like, um, which I mean, I guess is a strategy, but. You know, I, I, you know, like he's, he's creative, you know, like this, yeah. you know, he's, he's an Xer. He's a, he's a late Xer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, so, I mean, the Xers, you know, had, had the millennials, you know, theoretically, um, or, you know, the uh, late boomers as well had, um, oh wait, yeah. The, yeah, the late Xers, the last bit of Xers, or, or sorry, the last bit of boomers and the and the most of the Xers had the millennials. And yeah, so they, I mean, they're basically reacting to uh, the fact that they weren't really given as much attention um, as kids. So then they sort of overdid it maybe with the millennials. Yeah, absolutely. And one other thing I want to bring up about his opening monologue, and this continues throughout the entire movie, is that one of his big, like, complaints, and this gets back to one of the reasons you want to talk about this, is just as a critique of especially, like, you know, rich suburban life. His biggest complaint that he continues to come back to, that his sister also alludes to, is the fact that he didn't get a car. He got a computer <laughs> for yeah. his birthday. Like, yeah. that's why he's, you know, done with capitalism, basically. He doesn't have a car. But he doesn't have a job. Did he say he's done with capitalism? Well, I think that he just kind of... Uh, that was part of just throwing off all of the isms. Oh, yeah, but that just to me means he doesn't believe in anything. Not that he's right. Not that he's at believe. I mean, you don't have to. I'm not. I'm not too worried about someone just saying like, "Oh, I don't believe okay. in capitalism," especially if they're also saying they don't really. They don't believe in socialism. They don't believe in communism. Like, if somebody That's says, fair. you know, he, he's throwing off all isms. He's just. It's really more of a statement that he just doesn't believe in anything. Not yeah. that he's suddenly become 
a Marxist or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that that's fair. That's fair. Like that's actually in some ways a good critique of our civilization. You know, he's seeing that a lot of these isms are just are basically uh, perverting the conversation, mm. you know, making capitalism, you know, like your religion, you know, yeah. making socialism, your religion, making the state, your religion, you know, mm. that's the kind of thing, but he doesn't even think of religion as a, as a thing, you know, he doesn't even contemplate religion at all. Yeah. Yeah. That's very Re fair. Religion doesn't exist pretty much in this entire, um, which it doesn't really exist in rich suburban, uh, you know suburbs of chicago really i mean it kind of does in some degree but it's you know it's more of a like a, it's probably just like a, la a last bit of you know dying culture yeah so the other thing that i think was also interesting was just the emphasis that he and this is his ninth day that he's missing and if he misses a tenth then he might have to uh, go back for another year and so he really has to make the most of this particular day which both to me is like uh, obviously showing his lack of care about anything with his education because it's nine days within one semester but there's also the fact that almost all of this or all of this stuff if if he could, you know, I know logistically it's actually impossible to have done all that he did in one day, but any of those things could have been done on a Saturday or a <laughs> Sunday. Like he didn't have to take a school day off to do all of these incredible things. Yeah, that's that's true. In some ways, and I hadn't thought about that. Uh, that you know, like it could be could could be done on uh on a on a Saturday. Yeah. And um, his only justification was, can you expect me to go to school on a day as beautiful as this? <laughs> well, the thing is, is this is the mentality. Like it's a critique. Like I know in some sense, I don't even blame him too much because yeah. school is so terrible. Like you're talking, you're talking about like some of the stuff that they're teaching, you know, the laugher curve or like, you know, the smoot Holly tariff. Yeah. Um, you know, like that type of thing. Like, it don't that only matters if you know everything else. Like, what does it matter if you know specifically about like the Smoot Holly tariff or um voodoo economics? You know, like the, the, the context of this, you know, like our school system is all like education by pieces, yeah, more or less. So you you don't understand any of the context of anything in pretty much in school. It's all pieces. You know, this is why sort of an integrated uh, education is is much more preferable because at least you know why you're doing what you're doing and, you know, you have a purpose. So, of course, yeah, he's like European socialism. Why, why would I care if, you know, like the Europeans are socialists? You know, in some sense, I'm like, well, why would I care if the Europeans are socialists? You know, in the sense of like, how does that affect me? Okay, well, you have to go through a whole line of uh, sort of a whole like host of like um, different levels of education to understand why like uh, European socialism has any impact on America. Yep. Like, yeah. You have, to, and you have to understand the principles behind European socialism. You have to understand why, where it came from, why did it happen? You know, what was it a uh, response to? You know, you have to know so much that, like, most Americans, when they get into something like that, like European socialism, they're seeing it like they, I mean, Americans only learn about like more or less 300 years of history. Absolutely. And so most like, of that is America centric. Well, that's what I mean. It's because yeah. it is because like, it's literally like, um, uh, 1700s more or less to now. Yeah. And I remember specifically hitting a moment where I realized, okay, I've heard so much about communism and socialism. Vast majority of countries around the world. I don't know what type of government they run like what is uh, is spain socialist now like is 
South Korea. Like I, I just, I hit that moment. And this was after college when I realized I didn't even know what types of governments were being run throughout the world. So it just blew my mind when I realized just how little I actually understood about our global economy. And that's after college. Yep. Like how, how is Ferris Bueller in this situation supposed to like have any idea why he should care about European socialism? Yeah, absolutely. Like it doesn't make it, it wouldn't make everything's taught from an American perspective. So what is, what does it matter? Well, it doesn't. Yeah. You know, like if it, if it, his whole premise is if it doesn't affect me, why should I care? Yep. And that's exactly the point that, uh, and I'm not saying this is right because again, like you said, this is a comedy. It's not trying to preach a big moral message, but what it does try to push is basically this idea that if it doesn't affect me, then why should I care about it? it well, yes, it, it treats it more or less, you know, teaches us that things are so bad more or less, you know, society. So, you know, downhill, why should we care to even try and save it? Yeah. Cause that's, that's really the thing with the sister. The sister goes on this whole journey where she's sort of, you know, upset at Ferris for being able to get out of everything, getting out of the suffering sort of that, that she has to go through and that everybody else has to go through tired of his lies and his trickery and stuff like that. Yeah, and, and him winking at her at the beginning. <laughs> yes, but <laughs> but the whole system, you know, like she, you know, she recognizes at the end how bad the system is, and she she then sort of finds some admirability in Ferris's willingness to sort of get out of that system. Now, he, yeah. he you know, the way he gets out of the system is is terrible. But to be fair, like what do you expect children to do? Like if you're an adult, you might be able to have an influence on what the system is, you know, like what system your kids are going to go to school in, how to educate them, like what their lives should look like. But as kids, you're basically, you know, at the service of wherever your parents send you. So like, I get what I understand why both of them make their decisions. I just, wish like we are we're already in a bad place when kids are d doing those types of things yeah 100 percent. i think that it's really like uh, one of the greatest critiques ultimately is of that both parents working um oh, yeah. system because oh. i yeah i when you look at any of the characters uh, that are, you know, kids in this system, you have Sloan. Parents literally don't ever show up on screen. You have Cameron. Yeah. Uh, who, Sloan's, uh, Sloan's parents aren't even worth sort of acknowledging almost. And, you know, Rooney, when, you know, he sees uh, like <laughs> he sees um, uh, Sloan and Ferris. Ferris is pretending to be her father and sort of they, you know, more or less make out uh in the parking lot pretending to be you know like and he's just like oh well it's like that in the sloan household or whatever yeah. you know like that just goes to show he has no idea even who sloan's father is or like anything about them or you know like yep. they're so disengaged that you know like he's willing to accept that as being yep. your father Yep. And then you have Cameron, whose parents never show up, but his mom is out of town. And the only thing that his dad cares about is the Ferrari. <laughs> and then you have Ferris's parents, who, you know, barely even care that he's sick, other than telling him to stay home. One comes home and creaks up in the door, doesn't see that it's a doll in his bed that's creaking over and his dad sees him twice and just kind of shrugs it off because he sees something else afterwards like well, he doesn't the, think um, it's him yeah exactly just the amount of negligence and trying to ship your responsibility as a parent off to the school system 
is incredible. In Why also sort of preventing the school system from actually being a school system, like being yeah. like an actual, like they're not trying to get the schools to actually teach their kids. Mm -hmm. Like they're making no effort in doing that. Like you'd at least could see it there, you know, some admirable aspect if they tried to get the school, like if they were involved in the school system, trying to get them to like, I don't know, make good choices or make, you know, make good decisions regarding the school. But it's clear that they just kind of, you, as I said, use it as childcare. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, no, it's uh, Cameron's parents. The, you know, it's not just that it's the only thing he, the, the dad only loves uh, the Ferrari, but also that the, his parents hate each other. Yeah, that was a, a very poignant moment to me when, you know, uh, Ferris first proposed marriage to Sloan and Cameron's response was, well, I'll give you two reasons why not <laughs> my, my mom and my dad. <laughs> Well, actually, I, I didn't think did uh, Ferris propose. I thought it was just more of a conversation about why, like just marriage in general, because I thought she wanted to get married and he didn't necessarily he wasn't prepared for that. No, he like said, let's get married. He was saying, let's get married today. Oh, right. And but but she didn't want to. She wanted to do it the right way, like a more right way, I guess. Yeah. But then you have Cameron, who I think is ultimately the most like poignant character in this um entire saga but he just says you know yeah i i got two reasons for you not to do it today my mom and my dad they hate each other and, and you also yeah. see that later with ferris oh nope, uh, you. okay sorry i lost you for a second but uh yeah ferris um later on saying that you know cameron was going to just marry the first girl that he laid and he was going to be miserable because of that because she had given him everything he had thought to be the ultimate value of existence and you can never love somebody that sucks up to you so just the whole context and conversation around cameron and marriage i think is there's a lot to unpack there and just as Cameron as a character in general. Yeah. He, he I mean, he doesn't have any good role models. Uh, mm -hmm. His sickness is basically a ca caused by his parents. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's clear that he doesn't have an actual sickness. He's uh, more like out of fear for his life regarding the Ferrari. Yeah. And you see like, you know, he talks about him feeling like he's dying but then he goes out for an entire day full of escapades and never complains once about it. Oh, and he has all the drugs that you can imagine, you know, on his like nightstand mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Like he's taking yeah. everything like, you know, he he's um, he's basically medicating. Which I think, again, just getting back to your comment about it being a critique of the rich suburban life. If you don't have anything that you're living for. If you don't have anything that you're working towards, if school is pointless, he doesn't have any interests that he wants to pursue in school and, you know, in college after he graduates, why not just medicate yourself? Like there has to be something that you are trying to grow towards. Otherwise you will end up in despair and you either end up, you know, hurting yourself or, just going towards pure numbness if there's nothing else to work towards. Yeah. I mean, there's just, uh, they're really from their perspective. It's not, there's not much to live for. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're, um, and they're probably more or less just going to, um, get the, get money from their parents uh, more or less, and you know, until they die. And then once the parents die, they'll get all their money anyways. And how many kids do these people have? You know, it's it's not very clear, but, you know, it's almost like Ferris has one, one sister, but that's it. And then we really don't know anything about Cameron and uh, Sloan's families, but, you know, they don't mention sis siblings at all. And yep. uh, Cameron's alone, more or less, in his house. Um, 
I mean, there could be siblings. Maybe they're younger, but I think we maybe we might assume that they just don't have any anybody else. They might be just, um, you know, the product of, you know, sort of the one, to, like more or less like these these parents, you know, sort of, you know, fell in love somehow, you know, however they fell in love or they, you know, did what they, they explored, you know, pleasure and, uh, came, you know, what came out was, you know, Sloan from her parents and Cameron from his, and then basically their parents, you know, the love, their love died for each other. Yeah. It, I don't want to go down a tangent, but it just kind of reminds me of some of the, I think, terrible critique of marriage that sometimes is, or no, that is often prevalent throughout Stranger Things of just, you know, the wife that is completely unsatisfied with her husband and the husband. I've never just, seen this. <laughs> yeah, Stranger Things, I first season is good, the rest, eh, but I, it's not something that definitely has to be discussed more so let's i didn't go ahead i just didn't on. i just didn't understand why it became sort of successful because isn't it supposed to take place in the 80s or like 70s or something mid 80s yeah like it just seemed i'm like what what what's going on it like why are we why, why like i don't even get the premise of the show but the whole but you know from the marketing you know it, it became like a big hit for a period of time but mm -hmm. i really didn't understand it all why anybody like my age or you know even like you know would have any interest in it yeah i honestly like it's not even referencing directly movies that i grew up with like i didn't grow up with et but it references that in several different points but to me i found it just a uh, compelling and more than anything very original story which okay. it it eventually, I, in the subsequent um, series, I, after so season one, yeah. yeah, it was no longer original. But in the first one, like it, it was something I hadn't seen before, which is just so rare to come across these days. Everything is a Lega sequel or a reboot or something else. So anyway, sorry, yeah. didn't we this, need to take a yeah. step? This is a tangent, but I just think that American TV should really take some inspiration of how short series is are from British TV. Absolutely. I there I will not in any way contradict that. Though I'm when I would actually generally want, you know, some of the old British TV. I wouldn't mind more of the old British TV. I wish there some series were longer, but uh, but not too much longer, just just a little bit longer. Like they almost seem to cut things off like early and americans just let it let things go for way too long yep uh, and, uh the the mid 90s pride and prejudice miniseries from bbc with darcy uh played okay. by colin firth is okay, but you one can't of, you can't that, like expand that no no i i know you can't i'm just saying that that's one of my all-time favorites like i can go back and watch those six episodes anytime yeah we might have to do pride and prejudice uh sometime Ooh, absolutely <laughs> we might get darren as well you know if darren's yes. interested because he likes pride and prejudice a lot too uh which you know there's nothing strange about a bunch of dudes just talking about pride and prejudice nothing strange at all <laughs> no there's not <laughs> yeah i know yeah well some people might think it's a little strange but, yeah, well, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, if we do one, we'll show you why it's not strange. It's actually yeah. um, quite good. Um, you know, Charlotte Bronte, or uh, not Charlotte Bronte, um, Jane Austen, Jane Austen. Uh, best critic of women, you know, like, you know, yeah. there's no better critic than Jane Austen of women. Yeah. Um, anyways, in, in the proper way. So, oh, yeah, in a good way, but like, you know, just, you know, in, in a constructive way, too. Yeah. So uh, we've been talking just a little bit about Cameron. One thing I want to just bring up is how abusive the relationship is between Ferris and Cameron, at least from what I can see. Yeah, it's hard for me to determine whether or not it's really abusive or just male friends in high school. That's fair. Like, it, it, like, I don't know. It's just like, yeah, I, it, it would be abusive totally if it was like 
girls. But Cameron, like, you know, he's, you know, like, uh, I think it's like um, Ferris says to him on the phone, you know, like, if you don't come over here, uh, we're like, our friendship's over, blah, 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 blah right? And like, yeah. Cameron says, oh, you've been saying that for like, tw you know, tw 12 years or whatever. You know, yeah. you've been saying that for our entire friendship, basically, you know, like that type of thing. I'm like. I don't think that's really abusive or manipulative because they both more or less know it's not real. Yeah. I, and that that's a fair point. The reason that I think it's abusive is that it's set. Uh, I mentioned this before from the outset that like the biggest gripe that Ferris has is that he doesn't have a car <laughs> and all that he's doing is guilt tripping Cameron into coming over and giving him a ride like that's uh, again it, you do see other good redeeming moments especially at the end but you also just see so many moments where ferris it just appears is purely using cameron to get a ride and then also abusing that friendship with how he treats his dad's car yeah except for the fact that uh, cameron destroys the car at the end like you know like yeah it can't you can never you can't say that like uh ferris ever did anything at that bad like you know he may you know and i don't think their friendship is just because he has a car like i don't think he just call, called him because of, uh, of the car that was just sort of a convenience um uh but maybe i'm wrong uh i'm i'm trying i think i'm giving them the benefit of the doubt because i don't yeah. see ferris as an extreme like too too more too much more corrupted than the rest of them like i don't mm. feel like i i feel like the only reason why you might think he's more corrupted is just because you're in his head more or less at times you're getting his you're getting his monologue so you're seeing how de how void or devoid of like any of like good thinking he it he has but yeah, you know, like if you were in Cameron's head, you he might just basically be saying, "I wish I was dead. I wish I was dead." You know, like like in in some ways, you know, Cameron might be in a worse position. And the one thing I'll give you or give Ferris is he at least gives him some reason to live. You know, yeah. What whether that reason leads him in any good direction, it does. It probably won't, but it might lead him better than you know death. Yeah, All right. what we said also just uh, about Ferris not being really much different from the others brings me back to one of his like kind of infamous quotes of that uh, only the meek get pinched, the bold survive. Like yeah, he's just like everyone else. He's just actually bold about it. Yeah, it's more like temperament. He's more just yeah. like a sanguine or a choleric while uh or probably combination of the two while mm -hmm. it's um you know uh cameron's probably a melancholic or you know phlegmatic, phlegmatic something yeah. like that and then um you know i'm guessing sloan is like a sanguine phlegmatic or a phlegmatic sanguine something like that like yeah um it's it's more about you know we get to see his sort of uh different like problems or different like devices and you know like stated beliefs because he's just more willing to share yep absolutely like, as i said he doesn't do anything like insanely like like insanely insanely immoral yep like he just he kind of just acts like a really clever teenager like he lies but you know what teen you know what teenager doesn't lie these you know like especially yeah. in, the, in this in this like world that they've set up you know that they're yeah. sort of getting us into you know they're all lying yeah but the other thing also with him is that they cleverly place all of the lies and all of the mischievousness that he does so that it doesn't harm anyone else so it's yeah like, well, what's, we, what's the big deal well we don't see that but you could say it arms harms Rooney, right? And uh, that's an interesting point because 
Um, so I mentioned this before, but um, in before, the yeah, uh, before we got uh, started that there are two main antagonists in this film. There is the sister who is just uptight and hates that Ferris is able to get away with anything. And then you have Rooney. And on the one hand, you have the sister who ultimately like is proposed with like, well, what is Ferris doing that's actually hurting you? It sounds like it's actually something that's wrong with you from a convict drug dealer, Charlie Sheen in the police <laughs> station. And then on the other hand, you have Rooney who's so uptight. You see in the very first scenes that he's OCD, you know, fixing the things on his desk. He has Tums. Um, he actually goes and breaks rules in order to catch Bueller. Like he skips off of work. He breaks and enters and um you know he actually assaults uh and you know, he doesn't actually assault the sister but he's in there she gets freaked out and kicks him and he scampers away but he is so focused on the rules and his rigidity that he ends up breaking rules just to catch somebody that is breaking the rules, which is a contradiction. Yeah. And first, so like, you know, like the, the sister more or less blames Ferris for all the problems. Now, mm. you know, it, in some ways that it's the blame is in, is in the wrong place. You know, that so, I mean, obviously in some ways she wants the best for her brother, but she also just dislikes her brother in some ways. So it's not really like, she's not really out for his best interest. Yeah. You know, he, she's more or less like, uh, we all have to be in prison. Like you should be, in, you know, dealing with prison with us. Like, why do you get it? Like, get out of it. You know, yep. that, that's kind of her mentality. She recognizes the problems and she basically just more or less accepts the problems and aids the brother. Um, which also sort of can uh, prevents the parents from actually confronting the problem. Um, yep. Yeah, but I do sympathize with her. With her. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I, it's almost half of like she represents the prodigal son's brother, without the prodigal son ever actually having come home. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and she even goes to the police, you know, she gets picked up by the police for a phony call, which it wasn't phony. Um, at, yep. So, like, she's the only one who gets in trouble. Yeah. Of, of, which, like, the teenagers. Yeah, it's... Well, <laughs> we can also assume that uh, Cameron's going to get in trouble. Yeah, but not for the not for any, like, good reason. Like I mean, destroying your father's car is a decent reason to get in he, trouble. Yeah, yeah, I, but he, in some sense, he also destroyed an idol. Yeah, that's that's a fair point. Like in some ways, he destroyed everything that his father worships, and it was a thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Like, I, I, it's hard to blame him. Yeah. But I will also just say that, like, it seems like this huge moment of self-actualization that he, you know, is rebelling against his father's idol, and he's happy with it, with just, you know, denting the front. And then it actually goes off the jack, flies off into the woods, and he's like, oh, Nike's like... I'm going to have to actually deal with it. I don't think that would have, like, it might be the, in some sense the best thing for Cameron and his parents and everything, just like having a conflict. Yeah, that's fair. Because he has, he's basically have been avoiding his parents and everything that they deal with. And, you know, he destroys, he destroys his father's idol and, now he has to deal with the ramifications and the father has to deal with the fact that, you know, he, 
the thing that he loves above everything is destroyed. Yeah. The one thing that I really didn't like about that particular scene was that like up to that point, every time Cameron had referred to his dad, he'd said my father. And then after that, he's like, I'm going to have to face and he used his first name uh, rather than his mm-hmm. uh, uh, saying my father or my dad. And I thought that was just, I, again, it's not that the dad has been in any way a good father, but it was just a very much a rejection of fatherly authority. Yes. The, the, as I said, it, they have the, this movie has great criticisms, great critiques, but it has bad answers. Yeah. Though sometimes satisfactory ones, you know, like, like satisfying ones, one that's ones that make you feel good at, at the end of the story. That's what makes this such a compelling film is it gives you good answers. Like, Even well, if they're not, like, or um, sorry, it gives you satisfying no, answers. Like you yes, said, not good um, answers, not that good. Um, well-crafted answers. Yep. Um, yep. Re- almost reasonable answers. Yep. But going back to like the destruction of the car, to me, the uh, there are two redeeming moments for Ferris Bueller. The first is that he actually says, I'll take the blame. Like, say that this was my fault, which is huge because his parents would find out that he had been faking all day. Mm-hmm. Like, he's willing to own up to it. And that is a redeeming moment, even if he's not a perfect character. And then the second thing is that he wants to marry Sloane. He doesn't just want to be hooking up with her. Like, <laughs> he's like, I'm going to marry her. And even as he runs off through the backyards, she, uh, she even says, like, he's going to marry me. Like, there is some hope and some resolution there that like he's not just trying to have fun he wants to commit well yeah he like he wants a purpose in life and that's what makes him such a compelling character yeah he he just needs someone to give him that purpose and he but there's no no place in this wealthy suburban uh society that pretty much he can get that from Yep. That isn't, um, you know, like coded like in something really like um, cringy. Yep. Just imagine if he went to one of the one of his one of the Catholic churches in the area. Just think about how cringy it would be. Yeah. There wouldn't be there probably wouldn't be anything reverent or anything meaningful or, you know, like the sermons would be just, uh, you know, you know, not the same. The worthless. same five recycled sermons that you literally can't remember after they've been, you know, given because they're just the same fluff that has nothing of substance. Yes, and it's it would be the same thing as going to uh, his history class, more or less. Yeah, like it, it's more or less just you know, sort of you know, like the five things that you learn about American history. Uh, you don't really get anything, any detail, any depth, anything, anything, any purpose. You just need to understand this is why our society is like that. And you better conform to that or you will be in trouble. Yeah. That is basically our civics and our history. Yeah. There's nothing, um, you know, it, it. you know, the way it's taught sometimes changes, but usually that's because our society has uh, altered what it desires from the citizen, from its citizens. No, yep. um, so like, you know, maybe there's going to be an emphasis on race in history classes. Well, that's just because race is an extremely emphasized, um, you know, part of American culture now. Like you need to be, you know, as a white person, you need to be um, repentant for something you didn't do. Um, You know, that type of thing. So like, this is just how our culture treats itself. And he's looking for something with depth and purpose. And he, and the sad thing is he has no way of getting it in uh, at, at least as, 
as you see what's in front of him. And yep. the worst thing is that he's probably going to go to college. Yeah. Now, the thing to me that I think is kind of an underrated, like, and I had never noticed it until this viewing, was just how there is a slight undercurrent of a tragedy where I, a, a true good proper tragedy exposes a flaw in the main character that ultimately leads to their destruction. And with Ferris Bueller, the one thing that he mentioned in the beginning and was a thread throughout was his lack of a car. Yeah. But because he went on this escapade and led his sister on her own escapade that ended with her in the police station, her mom wasn't able to complete the deal that she said she was going to take the commission from and buy Ferris a car. <laughs> oh yeah. I didn't even think about that. I so it's I, it's a small thing and it it's so easy to miss. Cause I've missed it every time before, but it's just, I missed it too. I missed it even the last, you know, this yeah. last time. Yeah. So the one thing he most wanted like he had a great day, but then he lost out on a car because of it. Well, yeah, it's it, this is a comedy that more or less it, is if if you weren't laughing, you'd be crying. This, mm -hmm. this like this whole story is a comedy because of how it's shot, because of how it's because of timing, because, you know, because it's made into a comedy, but it could easily have been like, you know, you like flip a switch and it's a it's a um it's uh it's like a drama it's a tragedy yeah if you make cameron the main character it's oh, really yes. it's really not a happy story yeah and you just have some sort of levity you know that keeps people you know interested with you know like or distracted for a little bit with like having uh ferris but yeah. like if if you're in cameron's head you're going to be really depressed Absolutely. Yeah. It, um, let me think. Is there anything else? Uh, any other aspects you wanted to um, touch on? Um, the only other thing that I thought was not poignant, but just I think kind of realistic was when Cameron and Sloan were talking about you know, well, what do you want to do? And, you know, he said, well, I, I don't know. I don't know what I want to study in college. And after, uh, this was right after the big uh, float scene where he's singing uh, Don Shane and then uh, Beatles. She asks him, well, what do you think Ferris is going to do? And it's like, he's going to be a line cook at Venus or something like that. Like, he's not going to amount to anything of substance actually in life. He's just going to take a job and deal with it. And he's not actually going to find purpose. Like, yeah, he runs the school right now and, you know, he's getting people to donate for a phony kidney transplant that he needs. But when he's actually out in the real world, that type of character isn't going to run the show. They're going to be exposed for their phoniness. Like in a suburban rich high school, you can make that work. And for a time, maybe in the business world, you can, but it's not going to last long term. Yeah. And one thing also, yeah, you sort of see his persona. He sort of talks to different people. And he's helping them make different shortcuts uh, through different things. But I think the root of the critique is that the kid, the student shouldn't be wanting to make shortcuts. We've we've already hit a big problem, and that's the kind of system that has been set up is where the kids are trying to get around everything, um, which obviously means they don't care about the things that come out of doing the work that's required and maybe the work isn't worth doing mm -hmm. and they should be doing something else. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Were there any other things that you wanted to talk about from Ferris Bueller's Day Off? I can't think of anything at the moment. So let, let's just wrap it up uh, here. Um, Jeff, thanks for uh, discussing this with me. Thanks for watching it again. Uh, I, I hope that was a good a good time for you. And uh, maybe made you, I think you thought about it differently uh, watching it this time. Um, yeah. And I hope we've helped other people think about this movie differently. You know, if you're going to watch it again, you know, you know, obviously, you know, it, it's not it's uh, of all these types of movies. It's not a terrible one. You know, like, you know, it has its moments of crassness and stuff like that. But, um, you know, nothing too terrible. And what do you think regarding that? Yeah, absolutely. There's some language, uh, especially there's times of using the Lord's name in vain. But there's no gratuitous nudity. There's not you know, obviously violence or anything. So it's, it's something that you can digest and like think about without really having to worry about being, you know, insidiously infected by like, there's, it's not outright outrageous. It's a good fun movie and it's something that you can talk about. Yeah. And also if you watch the sort of TV version, you'll get, uh, a toned down language yeah. one. So, um, you know, if you're interested in rewatching it, you know, maybe do that if you are worried about the language and stuff like that. But, you know, it's um, of all the comedy movies, it's pretty, it, I, I would say it's tame. Maybe it's because it's from the 80s. I don't know. And maybe well, no, it was for, geared for uh, teenagers. I'd say it's particularly tame for the 80s because. There's a lot of really crass. Well, but but the geared towards teenagers. Like I don't think it like it's not geared towards adults. Right, but uh, 80s okay. has things like uh, I, and I've never watched it, but Fast Times at Ridgemont High and okay. like, other really bad stuff. So, well, yeah, it just I guess it depends on who's who's uh, who's producing it. You know, yeah, you know, what the demographic they're going for. I'm guessing they were going for a everybody watch this movie, you know, like a, you know, a blockbuster type thing. Yeah. And that makes it, and that makes them generally go for a cleaner uh, look to some degree. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Well, thank you everyone. Please like share, comment and subscribe, come back for more movie reviews and God bless everyone.